Will, I have a question for you. Let's go backwards here when I'm talking about triglycerides because <clears throat> there's a little bit of controversy. There's a little bit of a confusion um, about what actually can reduce your triglyceride value. So in our book, we talk about um, the differences between eating a ketogenic diet and a low-fat plant-based whole food diet. We sort of compare and contrast both the benefits as well as the risks in the long term. And some of the research actually was surprising to me that demonstrates that people who eat low carbohydrate diets and even very low carbohydrate diets like a ketogenic diet actually end up with lower triglyceride levels. Their LDL cholesterol level tends to go up over the course of time, and that's very repeatable. But yet studies demonstrate that their triglyceride level actually lowers in the long term, when, sorry, over the duration of the study. Um, but you and I both know that when an individual consumes a meal that is high in dietary fat, that over the course of the next few hours, their triglyceride levels do rise in their blood, and that can have a negative impact on their microbiome. So can you help me understand just a little bit here about why is it that triglyceride levels may increase in the short term, but in the over the course of weeks to months, the triglyceride level can actually go down on a ketogenic diet? Have you seen the same type of research as well? I have. Uh, actually, there was a paper published by Professor Christopher Gardner from Stanford University. It just came out earlier this year, and it was called the, the um, uh, Keto Med Study because it was comparing a ketogenic diet to a Mediterranean diet. And that was for weight loss and also blood glucose control. This phenomenon of the triglycerides going lower, I, I, there's a couple things that I want people to bear in mind, and then I'm going to turn you to the evidence that's going to make this very clear. First of all, measuring your uh, blood lipid profile, fasting, that would be like me making an assessment of whether or not you're a great athlete just by looking at you. Like it kind of doesn't make sense. I'm not saying that it's worthless. It's not worthless. What I'm saying is if you want to assess the value of an athlete, you have them run, you have them jump, you have them participate in a sport. You don't just look at them. That's not what right. they do, <laughs> right? You challenge them, right, and see how they perform. You challenge them. Correct. Right, and that's like the concept behind the stress test. Would you, would you assess a person's heart function without making their heart work, or do you make their heart work and then assess it? So when we look at blood lipids, we, it's important to look at postprandial lipids, postprandial meaning after a meal. That's where you actually get the true measure of a person's metabolism. And the problem with this approach is that this is not what is conventionally done in healthcare. Why is this not conventionally done in healthcare? Because it's harder to do. That's why. It's a lot easier to tell a person to just show up, show up fasting and we'll check your blood. We're done. That's easy. To say, hey, you have to eat a standardized meal, and then after your standardized meal, at a specific time, we're going to check your blood lipids to know where they're at. That's really hard to do. You can, you know, you can do that during a research study, but you, it's hard to do in, in common practice. So, but if you look at the research from Kevin Hall, Kevin Hall is a uh, metabolism researcher at the NIH, globally respected, and not agenda driven. Like I have no clue what this dude eats. I. I, I highly doubt that he fits into a specific box, but he cares about understanding like human metabolism and how it works. And he does studies where basically he will have people live inside of what they describe as a metabolic ward. This is like, you know, staying inside of a dormitory or something of that variety where it's like you live on campus and you get all your food fed to you by someone from this team that Kevin Hall has. And they did a study where they compared a plant-based diet to a ketogenic diet. And they went head to head. And every single person, they were randomized to one or the other, but then they would cross over to do the other one. And you did two weeks, two weeks completely plant-based, two weeks completely animal-based. And what they discovered in this study is that, so I guess, first of all, let me uh, point out a couple quick things before we jump into the results. Fiber, which by the way, affects the gut microbiome. Fiber is good for diabetes control. Am I right? Absolutely. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> no question about it. No okay. question about it. Uh, saturated fat. Cyrus, if you can't see it right now, he just rolled his eyes. 
All right. <laughs> Completely disrespectful, but that's okay. Because I don't think it's no, directed no, no, at no, me. No, no. It's because I just triggered him. I triggered him by with two words. <laughs> Saturated fat. Are you okay, buddy? No, no, no. The reason, I, sorry, I wasn't trying to roll my eyes. I just the gave him a stress I, test. I, <laughs> looking out the window is because the, the difficulty here is that there's so much confusion about saturated fat, right? People who are listening to this are going to walk away from this interview being like, okay, cool. Saturated fat has negative consequences. Let me try and limit my intake of saturated fat for these reasons. However, somebody could go put, turn on a podcast from a low carbohydrate expert and literally hear the exact opposite. It can message. be very so confusing. Yes. Rolling my eyes comes from the fact that it is too confusing in today's world, but that is a completely separate story. You well, continue talking. Th well, and, th and this is where we come back to high quality research from an NIH metabolism expert who has, does not have a dietary agenda and he's just trying to understand how things work. So like, okay, let's listen to what this guy shows us. And so we just said, Fiber is good for the gut microbes and fiber is good for your blood sugar regulation. Now, saturated fat. Saturated fat is bad for blood sugar control. Am I right? That is correct. <laughs> okay. Because among the fats, we were talking about lipotoxicity and how fats can actually make your insulin sensitivity worse, which we call insulin resistance. Among the fats, aside from trans fats, which... Some of them are now illegal. <laughs> saturated fat is the worst. And saturated fat is a dominant fat in most Americans' diet because this is the dominant fat that you find in animal products. And when you convert to a ketogenic diet, which is high in animal-based fats, like I'm excluding the sort of plant-based keto diet right now, most people don't do a plant-based keto. Like... I'm quite sure that it's more than 95% of people who go keto. It's an animal-based keto. There's no question about it. No and question about it. So excluding the, the plant-based thing, most people who go keto, they're going on a very high saturated fat diet. So in this Kevin Hall study, what you see, of course, is that on the plant-based diet, it was high in fiber and low in saturated fat. When they were on the animal-based ketogenic diet, again, this is only for two weeks each. It is low in fiber and high in saturated fat. And what you discover, if what I'm telling you is true, which is that fiber protects us from insulin resistance and saturated fat pr promotes insulin resistance by increasing the free fatty acids in our blood, what you will find is that there are higher levels of free fatty acids on the ketogenic diet. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. You can look at the data yourself. Look with your own eyes. It's there. So when you see the free fatty acid graph, you know this is what I'm telling you, that this is likely to translate into insulin resistance. And guess what? They gave them an insulin resistance test after two weeks. And what they discovered is that the people on the ketogenic diet, they had significantly, significantly increased their insulin resistance in just two weeks on a ketogenic diet. Correct. So these principles that we're teaching here, it's like, this. we're not just making this stuff up. This is not just like an idea. This is stuff that like you see this repeatable as a pattern in high quality research like Kevin Hall's research from the NIH Metabolism Ward.